Welcome to Growth Island, your go-to podcast on how to be the best version of yourself. Now, let's join your host, Mess Freeze, as he interviews high performers and experts in nutrition, meditation, exercise, relationships, business, general health, and life's bigger mysteries. Thanks for tuning in today. I got two experts on breathing today. So you might be thinking, how hard can it be to breathe? Well, it turns out we're not that good at it. That's why I got Martin Peters and Arthur Paulins in. They are breath work instructors and teachers teaching all around the world, making sure that you get the most out of your day, that you recover faster from injuries, and that you keep calm and happy. So uh, Martin and Arthur, thank you so much for joining in. Hey, thank you. Hey, thank you so much. So you do more than breathing. And uh, I know, Arthur, you can kick my ass pretty bad because you used to uh, <laughs> to do some martial arts as well. Yes, yes, that's my background. That's the, I guess, initial kind of drive to explore my own physicality and also my mentality. And uh, yeah, always looking for the edge, I guess, in performance. And yeah, I found that the biggest differentiating, differentiating factor was the mindset and uh, how to address. And then possibly that's where the breathing came in for yeah. me. Cool. And Martin, how did you get into all of this breathing? Yeah, so it's a great story because I actually, when I was one year old, um, my parents decided for me to, to get some airs and they left me in a buggy outside on the balcony in the middle of winter and they forgot about me uh, for about two hours. <laughs> so I got covered by like, two meters of snow. Yeah, so... I think that's where I subconsciously decided to work with the cold later on. And then I discovered Wim Hof Method. And that's how I got into breath work. And from that, I trained in Oxygen Advantage and other methods. Uh, but I think that was the decision at being one. Yeah. And just going back, you were two years old, got left for two hours, or one year, one year old, got left for two hours outside with a lot of snow. Did you get sick or what happened? No, I, I was perfectly fine, actually. And yeah, that, that shows how babies are tough, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's one of the really interesting things with cold exposure as well, that it's actually not as bad as most people think. It might actually be super good for you. But I think we're going to get much more into that today. Yes, exactly. And yeah, we both met at the Wim Hof Method workshop and then we decided to start working together. And then got into breath work quite a lot. Uh, so now we train with athletes and we do all sorts of workshops. Yeah, I know you're coming to Copenhagen soon as well, but uh, let's get more into that later. But why is breathing so important? For me, uh, at least I see it as a kind of almost a link between our mind and our body. And uh, in some ways, we can literally use the breathing to influence our state of being, our nervous system, our body. And for me, it's kind of a twofold thing. One is influencing the body, one influencing the mind. And uh, oftentimes we are told that we should be meditating and we learn meditation, how it could benefit us in terms of managing the stress and improving the focus and all those things. But oftentimes it's quite difficult to learn and takes years of practice to become proficient at meditation. And I find the uh, breath work is almost a link into that, a way in of almost a hack into the state of mind that you need to to have for meditation and if you think about it, meditation has been created and developed thousands of years ago but thousands of years ago we didn't have all notifications phones and and emails and for the modern mind possibly we need a bit of help a bit of assistance and that's is the breath work uh, for the mind you know that's that's at least how i see the biggest uh, benefit in terms of managing the mental side of things and also physiologically for or we also teach workshops uh, for performance and for athletes. So this can be a major benefit in improving the respiratory function, addressing, you know, breathing patterns and, and, and physiology. Yeah. And what's wrong with the way that we're breathing today? Right. So if, if you think about it, like there's um, quite a big cost in just sustaining your respiratory system. And when you're not doing much, it's, it's only a few percent, but... If you're doing heavy exercise, even up to 15% of your total energy can go into just supporting your, your breathing. And if your, your breathing is not dialed 
thin. For instance, uh, you've got some breathing pattern disorders, you're, like you're breathing too much with uh, with the mouth. Um, that can cause like permanent, well, I would say damage to your body. Like if you do it chronically over a few years, like for instance, mouth breathing can actually affect your posture. So it can overdevelop certain muscles in the neck, which in the end they are pulling the head forward and that can cause a huge disruption in the whole posture and the fascia and Arthur probably could tell you more about how bad posture is is actually bad for you he's a yoga teacher as well so breathing through the nose is better than the mouth yes, oh yes definitely, definitely. and uh, obviously if, if we think about the nose serves a certain function that's why it's not just decoration on our face it's actually we have to be using and breathing through the nose because uh, it conditions the air that comes in it uh, actually reduces the airflow, so it improves the oxygen uptake. Uh, it filters the air by way of, you know, small hairs and nose and mucus. It warms up there. So in the end of the day, when oxygen comes in, it's actually better conditioned for the absorption uh, when it arrives in the lungs. And also it reduce, uh, releases gas called nitric oxide, which helps with vasodilation and relaxation of the whole body. So there's a lot of functions that we bypass if we don't breathe through our nose. So mouth are, is for eating and nose is for breathing, obviously. But having said that, there are practices of breath work that focus on mouth breathing, and they have slightly different intention than just performance or just general health throughout the day. It's more of experiential breath work. And also breathing through the mouth can be obviously done at high intensities, like sprinting or high intensity exercise. But uh, oftentimes we start breathing through the mouth at much lower intensities that we could. So we could definitely sustain much higher intensities in exercise while breathing through the nose. So there's work that can be done. And also another thing that your nose is a very important sensor in, in your body. There's a lot of nerve endings in the nose. So if you think about it, if you walk into a new room, the first thing is that you just smell the air if if it's if the place is dangerous or not you know that's your your sensor and if people are not breathing through the nose they just lose that ability that can disrupt the whole system yeah so first thing try to breathe through the nose as much as possible when you're going for a sprint or let's say you're doing crossfit or something else high intensity should you should you still breathe through the nose or is that where it's okay to open the mouth a bit more well that is a complex question because that's that's the whole art of developing breathing programs is all about. So there are certain moments where we breathe through the nose and it also depends who is training. Is it a amateur athlete or a top level athlete? For amateurs, we would recommend like 50% of the, the whole workload should be done through the nose and that will be very beneficial for health and longevity. One one thing what we should mention is that breathing too much through uh, through the mouth can develop something like exercise induced asthma. This is this is a big one. So they done a screening of the UK Olympics team, and that was before Athens Olympic Olympics, and uh, 21 percent of the athletes had exercise induced asthma that is huge and that's double the the population in in uk and so, so what is happening is that if you breathe too much through the mouth that will suck out the moisture out of the, the airways and that will cause inflammation in the long term so that's why for just amateur athlete we athletes we would recommend just breathe as much through the nose as possible but of of course, there's going to be moments where you need to go to very high intensity, and then that's where mouth breathing comes in. But if you're able to train this sort of progression when you start off with the nose, then when it gets harder, you inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. And then if it gets really, really hard, you just breathe in and out through the mouth and then back again. That's called the gear system uh, developed by Art of Breath. We, we use that. and it's it's really really good it's kind of uh, intuitive but also some people for instance yes where when they start exercising they just go into mouth breathing and that's so great because they can save a lot of energy when they are breathing through the nose so ideally breathing in through the nose and out of the nose and then when it gets harder breathe in through the nose out of the mouth and then when you're like you're done you can use breathing in through the mouth and out of the mouth as well 
Yes. And th there is a caveat to that, like top level athletes and also depending on the sports, it, it's going to be hard for them to limit the intensity. Of course, it might be that they need to do a lot of intensive workouts. So uh, for them, um, uh, actually mouth breathing will be more common. They will have to do a lot of intensive workout breathing more through the mouth. So yeah. it's individual. All right. So what are some of the benefits of breathing in different ways? And what's, what's an example of a good way of breathing? So with, with all of this, it's possible to get lost a little bit. And we have a certain sort of guide on how you, you could just train your breathing uh, by doing this, uh, this progression. So we say that the basis of, of everything is just breath awareness, just watching your breath, being aware that you're breathing, being aware the, the way that you're breathing. And this is actually the basis of all breathing schools, just breath awareness. And like for me, this is the, the hardest exercise of all because we all, we can do some, you know, intense breath holds. That's not a problem. But just being aware of the breath throughout the whole day, being conscious of it, for me, that's, that's the hardest thing. So that's number one. Then we could focus on nose breathing. That would be the next progression just getting that in and for many people as well like it will be hard at first because we are really conditioned just to breathe through the mouth so nose breathing that would be number two okay then the next thing would be focusing on diaphragm breathing and we can go into the benefits of diaphragm breathing in a sec but just focusing on that and diaphragm breathing for people that might not be native speakers what is that so the diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscle just underneath your lower ribs. Yeah. Uh, it actually is the primary respiratory muscle, primary breathing muscle that helps us to pull the air in when it contracts. So oftentimes uh, people develop kind of uh, dysfunctional breathing in terms that uh, breath starts and the initiation of the breath starts at the upper chest uh, through use of intercostals, through expanding the ribcage. Uh, so by addressing this issue, we can, uh, by using the diaphragm, we can actually stimulate the relaxation response. It actually helps to stimulate that parasympathetic, that rest and digest nervous system, part of <clears throat> our autonomous nervous system. It can uh, increase melatonin and also reduce oxid oxidative stress in, uh, in the body. And there's been even some studies done on athletes who would just literally perform after their training in the evening, they would just take time to breathe through the nose and use diaphragmatic breathing for a certain period of time, but they, they found a decrease in uh, or the, all those stress hormones and improved recovery. So accelerate recovery by by virtue of just switching in that parasympathetic mode where they can start to recover earlier on. Okay, so it's basically breathing with your stomach, you could say that as well, instead of your chest? Or... In some ways, yes, but there's a bit more to it. So that's why oftentimes we coach people one-on-one -on -one or in workshops explaining that a bit more in depth. But in, in theory, that's that's pretty much probably the best way of seeing it, of, of actually breathing in to your belly, into your stomach more than your upper chest, and especially starting the breath in your in your lower abdomen, you know. And obviously, it has been discussed at length in different yogic practices and breathwork practices from before. Yeah, and also, it's, it's a very good exercise that you can do at the end of your workout. Uh, we would recommend that if you're finishing your workout, just what you can do, put your legs on the wall, elevate them, and just do some simple belly breathing for five minutes. And that will already get you into the uh, parasympathetic nervous system. You will already start recovery at that point. So oftentimes when I coach my clients or I teach classes later in the evening in strength and conditioning or, 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 or physical training, I would I would finish the session with a simple inversion just like Martin described and some diaphragmatic breathing to help with lymph drainage from the lower limbs and also you know getting that parasympathetic state going after evening training you know yeah so basically you put your bum on the floor you put your feet up in the air up against the wall and you breathe with your diaphragm or your stomach and for how long uh, we will recommend to do it at least five minutes uh, after the training. Oh, obviously, you know, how much time do you have? Uh, do you have to go back to work after your training or um, yeah, f finish your day? People have problems.
problems with you know putting the time in into breath work so if you even have like five minutes that's going to be very beneficial yeah how do we know this stuff works well there's some really good studies uh, and you know thing, things like nose breathing and diaphragm breathing we knew that since ages you know since the beginning of time we can find really old books where th these things are mentioned and y yogis knew these things for a long time ago now science is just catching up to it and also there's a really simple thing you can see for yourself because uh obviously if you logically think about it, there's a sort of parasympathetic nervous system so part of autonomous nervous system that regulates this uh, rest digest and recovery state of the body right uh if you you can literally feel like how the breath influences that but if you place you know two fingers on your on your neck on the artery and you can feel the heart rate if you take time to tune into that sensation of the pulse, if you start inhaling and you might notice the subtle difference as the heart rate accelerates as you inhale, and as you exhale slowly, you might notice the subtle difference as the heart rate starts slowing down. So this is a literally here and there, right here and right now, you can actually test this effect of prolonged exhalation on your nervous system so it's called a respiratory sinus arrhythmia so it's a really simple thing really easy to test with no equipment and see that breath can literally affect your nervous system almost as a as a remote control that can control your nervous system and again the nervous system controls all other systems that are in your body yeah it's really easy if you have a fitbit on other tracker to definitely see the the change in uh, your heart rate to see that it slows down and you start to relax a bit of a bit more and yes exactly that's that's really easy and you can even sense that by just literally taking your pulse if you can feel that in your artery or in your vein you know so that's yeah. as easy as that so it's, that's direct influence over our nervous system yeah and so what about you often hear that you have to breathe in a lot of air and slowly breathe out what's what's your take on that yeah, so that could be a, a bit of a mis misconception. Like we hear a lot of times, you know, oxygenate your body. And there's a lot of um, teachers who, who say that. And that's kind of true, but not, not in a way that we think about it. If we breathe deeply, if we breathe a little bit quicker, yes, we are going to get a little bit more oxygen into our body. But if you would test your oxygen levels with a simple pulse oximeter, you will see that you already are uh, quite saturated with oxygen. The, like the normal level is about 97, 98% of oxygen in hemoglobin. If we take a few deep breaths, that's going to raise the oxygen to 100%. That's, that's not a big raise. Yeah. And it, there could be a, like a situation where you have a lot of oxygen in the in the blood, but it's circulating and you're not releasing it into the tissue. So that's why we need carbon dioxide. So I would say carbon dioxide is very important um, part of the whole breathing cycle. And we actually need that in order to release the oxygen into the tissue. And that's where the misconception comes in. Like by breathing more, we are just going to exhale carbon dioxide and we're not going to have enough. That's the Bohr effect. And that's what uh, we, we base the training on. So that's why we are trying to breathe a little bit less, keep the carbon dioxide in, actually raise it in some cases, raise the tolerance to it, and that's how we get more oxygen into the body. The whole thing about holding your breath, can you say a few words about that? Yeah, so holding the breath is obviously a practice that's been done for a long time before, and, and the, probably the best example is the freedivers. We use it uh, quite often, obviously, for freediving. Uh, but there's other benefits that uh, us regular people who don't freedive can benefit from. So so the breath holding. So there's an organ called spleen in our body that actually holds a, it's almost like a blood bank, so it holds uh, red blood cells. And the red blood cells are the cells that uh, transport the oxygen throughout the body. So this, when we, we have these few strong breath holds, the spleen can release more red blood cells in the bloodstream. So that improves the oxygen carrying capacity of our body, through our body. So, and also another thing, it's uh, the it's called thing called EPO, erythropoietin, which obviously has uh, has been well known for in as a use for illegal substance in in uh, sports and especially in cycling. So actually, that's a it's a natural reaction of our body increasing this EPO in our body. So we can 
stimulate this increase of EPO just by breath holding for prolonged breath holds and EPO increases uh, yeah, hemoglobin and, and then it helps carry the oxygen throughout the body. So breath holding in the short term and also in the long term can increase uh, oxygen carrying capacity for blood. And with that, it can increase the performance, aerobic performance. So how long should you hold your breath? Well, if uh, you want to do simple breath hold training, then, well, any type of breath holds will be beneficial for you. So if you exhale and hold your breath as long as possible, that's going to be your maximum breath hold. If you do a few of these during the day, at least five, I would say, then that's going to definitely cause the release of uh, EPO and that's going to cause spleen contractions. Ideally, if you could do three sets of five during the day. Three sets of five. So what is that? Three sets of five minutes? So that would be three sets of five maximum breath holds. So you hold your breath up to the point that you really need to take a breath in. Yeah. And I heard there's some tricks to holding your breath for a longer time, like putting your nose, no, not your nose, your tongue up against the the top of your mouth. Is that true? Or any other things that you can do to hold your breath longer? Uh, I, to be honest, I haven't heard about this trick. But uh, the thing is with the breath holding, Max Berkeley, you still will feel that that dramatic contraction or that discomfort. This is just inevitable. You know, one thing you can do is actually if you, when you do breath holding, try to do it seated or in a safe space so you don't, you know, pass out or fall over. But what you can do, you can actually just sway from side to side or just get yourself distracted a bit and just move slightly just to keep yourself occupied while you experience that uh, discomfort. And other thing also to help uh, with breath holding, what I've learned from a friend of mine who's a free diver, you can actually... Once you reach maximum breath hold, you will feel diaphragmatic contractions and contractions in your lower belly. That's the diaphragm trying to pull air in. That's the way to find it. And also you can count those contractions. So if you hold your breath, you might be able to count three contractions or five. And that's a way kind of uh, ex ex extending that breath hold, actually counting those contractions and, and aiming for a goal of maybe five contractions before you take a breath in. Yeah. And that's for sure you have maximum breath uh, maximum breath hold and also the simplest trick to uh, extend your breath hold would be to get rid of carbon dioxide you know to take a few deep breaths prior to to breath hold but the, the thing with that is that depends what we are aiming for so if we want to beat records yes that's going to increase our breath hold um, but if let's say we, we're doing free diving I would totally not recommend to do that. And all the free divers are saying that this is the worst thing what you can do because then you don't have the the stimulus from your body to take a breath in and you can pass out underwater. That's called a shallow water blackout. It could be very, very dangerous. So, and also like if you're after increasing your tolerance to CO2, then you don't want to get rid of it. Of course, holding your breath will have the, the purpose of simulating altitude training so you're burning off oxygen you are lowering the amount of oxygen in your body and your body is slowly getting adapted to that but also what we can do is use it for building up our tolerance to carbon dioxide which in the long term is going to be super beneficial for us whether it's sports performance or just you know wellness and longevity yeah so when we do the holding our breath do we breathe out fully or do we suck in a lot of air first and then hold our breath? So there's, again, many uh, different exercises. So you can hold your breath after the inhale, after the exhale. But I would just simplify it. And if you can train, train yourself when doing breath holds after a light exhale, so you're not pushing all the air out. It's not a forceful exhale. You're just lightly exhaling. You can pinch your nose as well and hold your breath. Um, also, what you can do is add a little bit of movement to it. If, uh, like at, at the beginning, if you don't have a lot of experience, then I would recommend doing it, it seated, like artist says, have health and safety here. But then later, if you know your body a little bit better, then you can add a little bit of movement, like uh, walking or jogging or even running. Okay. And so that leads into next. So I know you cheat the Wim Hof method as well. So when you breathe out the Wim Hof method, do you breathe fully out or just? <sighs> so as Wim Hof method, the breathwork exercises, it's quite simple and easy routine. And there you do just the 
so what Q works for me usually guiding the breathwork sessions is just think of sigh of relief, just comfortable exhale without any force and still retaining about, uh, you know, 30 to 40% of air in your lungs. So, and that's, if you exhale fully, if you force the air out, you actually create a bit of a vacuum in your, in your lungs lungs and that is, is uncomfortable to be there for a prolonged time in a breath hold so you can still retain just a little bit of air just to make yourself more comfortable and uh, to stay longer great so one of my friends tried doing that for a while um, and he was like is it supposed to hurt in my stomach muscles is that just because he's so weak in his uh, stomach from not breathing properly or is he doing something wrong the thing with diaphragmatic breathing so uh, the breathing in itself, like uh, when Hoffman the breathing, obviously we would need to see how he's performing the breathing because there's there's more to the technique and more to actually control of diaphragmatic muscle and 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 respiratory system. So there's a lot to kind of learn and improve. But another fact is that uh, he might just getting a, be getting a stitch in the side of the ribs, like he would be from running. So if the diaphragm is not used to pumping air like for example you know in a breathing exercise or with long duration aerobic exercise you will get pain you'll get you know discomfort in your diaphragm because that's another muscle just like any other in your body so by improving the diaphragmatic muscle you can improve the sports performance yes exactly and well many people are, they just don't use the diaphragm and it's just not used to the work and during breath work we are doing quite a lot of exercising of the diaphragm that the diaphragm is quite prone to fatigue. So if um, if somebody gets gets tired, breathes a lot, then the blood can literally be stolen as if from, from the legs to supporting uh, the, the breathing. Actually, the breathing is more important than than you know boxing or running or whatever you do. So uh, in that way, exercising the diaphragm can be very beneficial for um, you know delaying the onset of fatigue and that's why we do in the workshops things like uh, Kapalabhati, Breath of Fire, Bastrika, you know, uh, things like vacuum exercises. These are all the things that can exercise the diaphragm and therefore help in sports performance. Mm -hmm. So what are some low practical things to do in regards to breathing? So one thing is after an exercise, we put our bum to the floor and our feet up in the air and we breathe through our nose and our diaphragm. What do you do when you work in an office and you don't move that much? So again, we're going back to the simplest thing of breath uh, awareness, you know, because that underlies all of the practice we talk about. That's kind of the the most fundamental and also in some ways most challenging. So if you can just revert back to your breath, you know, like Martin had uh, this interesting practice that he came up with some time ago with just counting mindful breaths throughout the day. So just as you breathe without any interference, without any force, any specific exercise, if you can become aware of one breath, full cycle of inhale and exhale, and just make a note of that, that uh, or, you know, and make little ticks in your notebook, and at the end of the day, just count up how many breaths have you done. So all, and this brings the mindful awareness to the present moment. So you kind of almost have these micro meditations throughout the day. So that's a, a nice and easy practice to have uh, for mindfulness. Because obviously, in as I believe, our mind is first, and then we can start addressing the physiology and body, you know. And uh, the simple, another exercise, which is called uh, reduced breathing or breathe light. So all you do, imagine your breaths as they are without any interference, just as you sit now comfortably on your chair, breathing in and out through your nose. And, and the best cue for this is making your breaths slower and longer to the point where if someone would be observing you, they wouldn't be able to say if you're breathing or not. Right, and you maintain that uh, that reduced breathing for three to five minutes, and your aim is to actually get to the point where you're experiencing slight shortage of air, like the slight shortage of air, and the desire to breathe more. So you sustain that hunger for air, and it's it can be a little uncomfortable, and so that's a really simple exercise: how to focus your mind, how to meditate, how to use this shortage of air as an anchor for your attention and also increase the CO2 tolerance of the body, which can have uh, major implications on your health and also on performance. Exactly. And this brings us back to something which is called central governor theory. It was developed by Tim Noggs 
So the principle is that we have a governor in the brain which monitors like the, the oxygenation of the heart and possibly the, the brain and the diaphragm. And, and if we are doing heavy exercise, the central governor will trigger things like fatigue in order to slow the athlete down. If the oxygen gets too low or if the carbon dioxide gets too high. And you, you can see people who are running ultra marathons, people like David Goggins, they can override that central governor pretty easily. Like uh, they can trick the, the brain not to send the fatigue to, to the body. And that's the principle of, of the breathing exercises that we are raising the CO2 levels and decreasing the, the oxygen levels and therefore teaching our brain to just function optimally at those levels. We, we don't get that, uh, you know, pain and burning and, and fatigue and we can go, uh, you know, we can run longer. So this is basically it. Things like the, the breathe light exercise, this is teaching our body that we can function at high levels of carbon dioxide. We can tolerate them. Therefore, we are breathing less during the day. We are staying more in the parasympathetic nervous system and we are just more healthy. Mm -hmm. And so what if you are in a fairly toxic environment? Is it still good to do these kind of breathing exercises or is it better to breathe shallow in that case? You mean toxic environment in what way? So polluted environments. Polluted so, environments, yes. I mean, the best is definitely keep on breathing through nose because obviously that's a, it functions as a filter for the air. You know, and if you can reduce the breath's respiratory rate, you're gonna obviously have a less exposure and less volume of air circling through your body, and reaping reaping the benefits also increase CO2 and uh, CO2 tolerance. So yeah, reduce breathing breathing through the nose as much as you can, and especially uh, like in cities like Copenhagen, like London, where where we are, and uh, when you cycle, always using the nose breathing and uh, and cycle at the pace. Uh, that you can maintain the breathing through the nose. So if you have to open your mouth and three, breathing through your mouth when you cycle, just slow down and keep on breathing through the nose. So that is going to help you just reduce the impact of of any pollution in the air and use your nose as it should be used for the for its own purpose. Yeah. And so people that find it really hard to breathe through the nose, like might all kind of feel exhausted from having to breathe through the nose. What's a good way of practicing that? Is it just like practicing breathing through your nose 10 minutes a day slowly building up so it becomes more natural or what would you recommend uh for me i had a personal experience with my own nose uh, breathing because i had two surgeries on my nose to fix the deviated septum septum obviously all consequence of uh, mma and boxing and martial arts training and um, and after my second surgery uh, before that that second surgery, I had spent five years pretty much breathing through my mouth because my nose was totally messed up. Uh, I did the surgery, my septum was straightened out and I still wasn't breathing through my nose. And I wasn't sure why, because in theory, my nose should be open and clear, you know. So it took me a while to retrain myself to, to breathe through my uh, through my nose. So actually, to conscious effort of shutting my mouth when I'm even sitting down at the, on a chair at work, at a desk or... And just breathing through now. So there's obviously at, at first it's going to be uncomfortable, but with time you can learn to uh, to get used to that. And uh, another really uh, beneficial and kind of simple technique is that we we'll learn from Patrick McEwen, uh, the uh, author of Oxygen Advantage. Is actually taking a micropore tape, that is light tape, and uh, taping your mouth, your lips closed when you go to sleep. So it means that the whole night you're spending breathing through your nose. So if you have a, for example, for listeners, if you, if you wake up in the morning and your mouth is dry and you need to drink water, that means that you spend pretty much most of those eight hours breathing through your mouth, getting dehydrated and, and you know, probably developing some conditions like sleep, uh, uh, sleep apnea that can lead to, you know, pretty severe consequence afterwards. And just by simply reverting to breathing through the nose, you can start improving the health and also improving the sleep quality. Uh, so that's a simple way, but there's no, no way around it. So all you need to do is just consciously remind yourself of breathing through the nose, taping your mouth when you go to sleep. And also when you go for a walk, when you, uh, cycle, when so you we're run talking, at the low pace. we're talking duct tape to your mouth. Uh, if it can't be fixed with duct tape, it's not worth fixing. 
first start with a microport tape, and if you really snoring, then use duct tape on your partner. You know, okay. <laughs> if, if they if if they tell you that you shouldn't tape to your mouth, you know, then you use the duct tape on the partner. You know, yeah. but for yourself, keep the microport tape. I would recommend at least that. Okay. Uh, I've tried both, and I I prefer microport. <laughs> Doesn't hurt as much. Yes, and you have mustache, you won't have them anymore. anymore. Yeah. Cool. And and it's a, it's a really a big one, you know. With uh, I had an operation on on my nose, yeah, <laughs> to make it look better. No, uh, of course the, the deviated septum. But um, the the thing is that after the operation, for about six years, my nose was totally blocked, and I had huge inflammation. And only when I then started to permanently breathing through my nose, it was getting filtered and the inflammation was gone. So it's like, if you don't lose it, you use it. We, we have to be breathing through the nose all the time. And Arthur mentioned sleep apnea. That That is a really big thing. And like it can occur five to 50 times per hour in, in severe cases. And uh, the oxygen levels can drop as 50%. So this is not really training you know breath holds is not simulating altitude uh, but it's really you know dropping the oxygen so low that it can be very bad for for the heart and of course it can disrupt the sleep it does disrupt sleep very much so your whole recovery goes out of the window for athletes it's really bad and yeah if you wake up and have a dry mouth that means you're been breathing through the mouth tape your your mouth breathe through the nose you're gonna have much better sleep much better recovery and you're gonna be training that nose breathing got it so you guys do a lot more healthy stuff than just breathing what are some of your other tips or stuff that you do in your life to be the best version of yourself so for me i do quite a lot of movement so i coach people on uh uh, movement practice and strength and conditioning as well teach you and I feel for me the biggest change in the way I feel and the way I move and I can you know uh, be pain free in my body is has been yoga and actually finding a good yoga teacher with a, a bit more modern approach to to movement and, and uh, for me that was a big thing and actually addressing mobility issues in my body especially with the hips shoulders all that can tie in so much into other performance and just in general, just quality of quality of being and especially mobility. And also as we age, the two primary conditions we should be working with is actually retaining the muscle mass in our body and also retaining the mobility of our joints. So those are two things that probably are quite important for me as I, as I carry on training and, 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 you know, performing. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Martin? Yeah, for me, well, obviously we are Wim Hof Method instructors. We work a lot with, with the cold and, you know, your your crowd is biohackers and they know all the benefits of cold exposure. That's that's huge and we work a lot with that. But also we work quite a lot with heat, with saunas and there's some really good studies on heat exposure. And uh, re recently when we were in Poland, actually, Otto actually... Uh, told me to that he told me that I'm doing the song a bit wrong and uh, yeah I started doing it a bit differently so when we go into the sauna now we we don't spend a lot of time like the in the first go just have a little literally a warm up so staying up to the first point that we are just breaking some sweat and then going out and then the second exposure would be longer so I've been doing sauna for, for years in the wrong way that I used to just go in and spend like 20 minutes in the first go. And that's so great. And I actually measured it with an aura ring mm -hmm. that it's much more beneficial to start off slow. And what measurement did you look at at the aura ring? You sleep or? So for me, it was uh, the quality of sleep. So sometimes if you do sauna, which is quite intense later in the evening, uh, disruption of sleep. So really reduce the deep sleep uh, levels and also restfulness. So I actually wake up quite a lot more often throughout the night if I have uh, done sauna quite intensely. So, and uh, yeah, so the, probably the easiest way to actually easing into it by starting, as Martin said, with a like 10 minute exposure where you just barely breaking sweat when you're just getting warmer and then going out, cooling down and going back for interval, uh, you know, so for more reasonable intervals with 
a bit more warm up, you know, and that, that, that actually, actually improved my sleep. And, uh, so sleep quality, more deep sleep and, uh, even some, so for me, a tendency is I don't get as much REM sleep. So actually it helped to get a bit more REM sleep for myself personally. Got it. And just a few words on the cold exposure. So we haven't really touched upon that, but you guys got to sit three minutes in ice water, just sitting and breathing. What is that? What's up with that? I mean, again, it's the power of the mind, right? So for me, I take cold exposure as a practice for our mind. Obviously, we have these major physiological benefits that are happening from uh, being exposed to, you know, environment for, for, you know, cold or heat. But for me, I see cold as a mindfulness practice, as a way of building the resilience and building the awareness. And uh, and that's why it's amazing to see when people come in for our workshops and they haven't done any ice baths, even haven't done cold showers. They're sometimes amazed by uh, the ability to go into the cold. It all depends on a set and setting and preparation. And that's our job is help you get into that state where you can ease into it and experience the cold exposure in a really positive way that uh, is not traumatizing and is not pushing you away from that experience. And I believe it's all in the mind. And, uh, and that's our job to create that experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. Do you have any routines that you do? So a, a good good routine, well, basically any kind of routine that you, you do in the morning, if it's consistent, that, that's going to be super beneficial for you. If it's any kind of breath work, if it's yoga, stretching, and or doing a cold bath, that's going to be super beneficial for you uh, if you're going to be doing that, that consistently. So that's one thing. Uh, definitely having a cold shower in the morning or a cold bath or, or a nice bath if you can will be great doing any type of breath work in the morning it's is great that will set you up for the day and especially like breath work in the morning is great because you are in a fasted state and that will start your day off really well so i usually do some breath work and have some sort of cold exposure whether it's cold shower or i, I do have a nice bath as well i don't do it every day though no all right where can people find more about you guys? So if they want to dig deeper into some of this stuff or learn more from you guys, what's what's the opportunities for that? Uh, actually, the best way probably is uh, uh, looking us up on Instagram because that's where we're most active. Uh, so for Martin, it's Martin Petrus London on Instagram. For me, that's Arthur Paulins. And also our Facebook page, Nice Collective London, where we have all the events posted and uh, also our group where we have everyone joining who been to our workshops or our activities. And that's kind of a, almost like a group of, you know, enthusiasts of environmental conditioning, breath work and, and just health influence over our lives. And, uh, and I'm actually coming to Copenhagen on 4th of May for another workshop. It's happening in uh, in a place called Inipi Sauna Goose, and so it's going to be a combination of, of obviously breathwork, Wim Hof method, ice bath, and also there's going to be a professional sauna master who can guide people through the experience of sauna. So it's going to be an interesting combination of adding another layer to experience of cold exposure, but also experiencing a proper way how to do uh, heat exposure. Mm -hmm. And so you do. You both do workshops on how to breathe, how to have cold exposure, and you also do personal training. Yes. So for me personally, I do coach people one on one in uh, movement and strength and conditioning. Uh, I teach yoga and mobility classes as well, and we both teach breath work classes, which are obviously in London. So we we teach classes on that, and we run workshops on breath work. So both breath work for. I guess for more of a mindful approach to life and learning to use breath work as a meditation, as a mindfulness techniques, and also breath work for performance, which are the workshops specially prepared for you know professionals in the fitness industry and or athletes that are uh, looking for, to gain a performance edge by using the breath work. So we kind of cover different angles, different perspectives, and uh, explore quite a wide variety of approach to breathwork performance recovery and uh, lifestyle awesome so before we round off any last one to three tips for the listeners out there yeah so a, a good tip 
would be doing some kind of breath work. And you could do something simple as box breathing. So you inhale for a count of, let's say, four or five seconds. Then you hold your breath for a count of five, exhale for a count of five, and hold the breath for a count of five. So it's equal count, inhale, hold, exhale, hold. It's a very simple method. A lot of people know that. It's been used by Navy SEALs and a lot of athletes. And you can use it just to relax or just after, you know, starting the recovery after the, the training, before sleep, just to lower your heart rate down, uh, get into the parasympathetic nervous system and optimize your sleep. So that would be my tip. And for me, probably the best tips is like, probably almost the same thing. You know, I use the uh, simple routine like uh, Wim Hof method breathing. So you can find it online. And uh, also it's a simple practice of breath holding and uh, hyperventilation. And uh, I do it usually in the morning. So I start my day like this and I uh, so I, literally I set the timer for 10 to 15 minutes. I do quick rounds of breathing and I finish uh, with just simple breath awareness, mindfulness meditation. And I believe that a lot of these practices are uh, really great to start off you on a journey in terms of learning about your own mind and body. But with time, it's all about the discipline and, and developing that subtle awareness of your breath, your body and your mind. Sounds good. Martin and Arthur, thank you so much for, for joining on uh, on this interview. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And and thank you for having us on, on the podcast. And we think that you're doing a brilliant job, you know, spreading the, the word of health and wellness and all, all the biohacking, which is contributing to just better well-being. So thank you so much. And you're doing a, a great job. Thanks for listening to this episode of Growth Island. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes on how to be the best version of yourself. And if you found this show helpful, then please leave us a review so more people will learn about the podcast or share it with a friend who can benefit from it too. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.